Hi, Rod, are you there? I'm here. How are you, John? I'm doing well. Uh, let me just um, start with the introductions. My name is John Horgan. I'm a science writer for uh, Scientific American. I teach at Stevens Institute of Technology, and I'm an occasional science correspondent for Blogging Heads TV. And uh, Rod, please introduce yourself to the audience. I'm Rod Adams. I blog at Atomic Insights and, and the producer and host of the Atomic Show podcast. I started blogging before there were blogs on Atomic Insights in 1995, and I've been doing it pretty uh, strenuously ever since. Uh, I learned about nuclear energy as a commission officer in the U.S. Navy submarine program, and uh, pleasure, pleasure to be here. Well, I just want to tell people how we... Um we met, it was actually almost a year ago, I wrote a piece for Scientific American expressing my concerns about a revival of nuclear energy in this country. Uh, Barack Obama was pushing for that. And um, I was worried about uh, security issues, for example, uh, terrorists attacking uh, nuclear plants. I happen to live right near uh, uh, Indian Point nuclear power plant. And then I appeared on Blogging Heads TV and reiterated some of my concerns in a conversation with George Johnson. And then you emailed me and uh, very politely told me that I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> and uh, we ended up having a conversation on Blogging Heads and you uh, actually persuaded me that um, nuclear power was the way to go, that it, it, it really represented a, a a, uh, a very reliable, safe form of energy that could help us cope with the problems created by fossil fuels. So when these problems started arising at the Japanese reactors um, last week as a result of the earthquake and tsunami, I, um, I immediately thought of you and uh, what you would think of what's going on over there. And so that's why I asked you to uh, to appear on Blogging Heads with me again. So thank you. No problem. So what you're saying is you need a, a booster shot on my uh, assuaging of your worries. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've got to admit, Rod, I'm, I'm pretty alarmed by what's going on. I should just tell people that it is now um, uh, Tuesday morning. Let's see. It is uh, March 15th, and uh, there are what I would describe as alarming reports um, from Japan about uh, what's going on at the Fukushima reactor. So I wonder if you could start just by telling us, um, by summarizing what's going on in Japan right now from the point of view of an expert. Well, the first thing I want to say is that what happened in Japan on the 11th of March was a nine, a cat, nine on the Richter scale, I guess, uh, earthquake, followed about an hour later by a tsunami that has killed probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 people, wiped out a whole bunch of villages along the coast, caused major damage to a number of industrial facilities. And, oh, yes, there were some nuclear plants that happened to be hit as well by that natural disaster. And for some reason... Uh, the major news media is focusing the world's attention on what's happening at the nuclear plants and breathlessly uh, describing every step that the operators are taking to put their plants in a safe shutdown condition and, and uh, raising a lot of fears and worries among people who really don't quite understand what's going on. And I guess if I didn't understand what's going on, I'd be really afraid as well. Mm -hmm. Well, so, why... So, so tell us from your perspective what is going on and what are the legitimate um, concerns that um, you have. Okay. The first thing that's going on is there's a, a set of reactors. At, there's actually two different stations, uh, Fukushima Diachi and Fukushima Diani. And that's actually the first. Uh, Diachi is, is first and Diani is second. So it's the first uh, nuclear station in Fukushima and the second nuclear station in Fukushima. Uh, Fukushima Diachi has four reactors, and Diani has, I think, three or four. Um, they're both on the coast, uh, 
were hit by a tsunami that was roughly uh, seven meters uh, high, and that overwashed uh, some of their facilities. The first thing that happened was the earthquake. Uh, at the time of the earthquake, all of the reactors were shut down. Not that they were operating before the earthquake, they got shut down as soon as the earthquake happened. All the control rods were inserted, the criticality stopped, the thermal generation from fission stopped, and from that point on it was a matter of getting the plants cooled down. Because nuclear power plants, unlike some uh, forms of heat generation, don't stop producing heat right away. You stop the reaction and there's still some decay. Uh, initially about 6% of the thermal energy uh, continues to come as decay. Within an hour it's down to about 1.5%. Within a day it's down to about 0.4%. Uh, and within a week it's down to about 0.2% of the initial thermal energy. But that's still a fair amount of energy being generated, enough to boil off some water. So the uh, people are having to s cool down the plants. Now, normally that's not a real hard problem, except if you have no electricity to power the pumps that circulate the water and to power the pumps that resupply new water. So since uh, Friday, apparently the plant has been without power. Uh, they initially were able to start backup diesel generators, and those got uh, turned off an hour later when the tidal, when the tsunami came and washed out the, the uh, diesel generator uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That tsunami also damaged the switch yard outside the plant, which complicated the effort of bringing in emergency generators because there was really no place to hook them up. Uh, so the operators at the plant are going through a very difficult time, but they're going through procedures that are laid out in advance and that they train on, at least in, in a certain amount of uh, detail. They can't train on complete detail because as an operator, I never knew exactly what was going to happen. Uh, we knew that things could go wrong and we knew that we would have to respond to whatever situations we had with the equipment that we had and to make things safe. But the thing that gives me confidence is a good friend of mine is Ted Rockwell. Uh, he is a, a very uh, sage old man who uh, was Admiral Rickover's technical director during the time that the Navy built the Nautilus uh, nuclear power plant and then was, there, was still the technical director when the Navy built the shipping port reactor uh, along with Westinghouse, the very first nuclear power plant uh, in the U.S. light water reactor. So, and Ted was in the business of engineering is in whole life. Very smart engineer, very uh, sound guy, and along with uh, a, a, 10 of his esteemed colleagues in the nuclear business, uh, they went through a period of, of intense study after the Three Mile Island accident to analyze exactly what happened, what went wrong, what went right. The uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission supported studies to determine what happens in the worst case scenarios if to a light water reactor, if you lose cooling, if you don't have power, all these kinds of things. And at, as a result of those studies and a result of the post-mortem of the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant where the, re, the operators accidentally, of course, provided us with a tremendous amount of, of real world detailed data on what happens if you don't supply cooling water to a formerly operating nuclear plant that starts off with a lot of decay heat and eventually loses cooling. Mm -hmm. And they wrote a paper about what that the result was. It, it published it in the Science Magazine of uh, September 20th, 2002. And essentially the result is that no matter what you do to the plant, you can have a break in the, in the uh, pressure vessel, you can have cracks in the uh, uh, containment. You can even have somebody deliberately attacking the facility, but because of all of the materials, all of the, the layers of protection, the water that's in there, the way that the coolant is, I mean, the uh, cool, the core rods are designed, the materials that are in there, 
the end result is that no significant amounts of radioactivity will leave the power plant itself, which means the public is protected. And so I've been confident that there is no danger to the public. There's a lot of work to be done. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that plants are perfect. I'm just saying that they've got so many layers of protection and so many things that are going to reduce the amount of radioactivity that could possibly get out that the public doesn't have anything to worry about That for that. They've got lots of other things to worry about. They need to find water. They need to find food. They need to you know, get rid of the dead bodies. They need to find the missing relatives, find shelter for people. There's lots of things to worry about. The power plant, nuclear plant, is low on their priority list. But, okay, I'm, I'm just, um, I, I sent you a link to the New York Times piece um, this morning on what's going on over there. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess that there are, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that there are um, three different reactors now that apparently have had uh, partial meltdowns. There have been three separate explosions. I don't know if these mm -hmm. are from uh, the buildup of uh, uh, hydrogen gas, but there have been some fairly significant um, radiation releases already. There have been, uh, there are elevated radiation levels being detected in uh, Tokyo, which is more than 100 miles away from the uh, Fukushima plant. Um, my sense is that the uh, the Japanese officials themselves are are frightened about what's going on now. Apparently, um, the spent fuel rods in a storage facility have uh, have caught fire um, because they, uh, they they lost the water that was keeping them cool. Uh, so, uh, I mean, why? Um, I, I think that the New York Times has, has it seems to me to have been uh, doing its best not to make people too alarmed about what's going on over there. But this story right here this morning, um, I find very alarming. So um, so just give me your perspective on what's happening right now with these apparent meltdowns, uh, with the problems with the um, the spent fuel rods that are completely separate separate from the actual reactors and, and how things are unfolding. Okay. Um, let me make sure that I can get this. Uh, right. What you have is three reactors where there has been things like uh, s small explosions. And I'm, I'm going to say small, although they look dramatic, but they only lasted a few seconds. If you look at the videos of the explosion on Unit 1 and the explosion on Unit 3, um, the source of hydrogen is a little bit confusing to some people. And I'm not positive what it is either, but I do know that hydrogen is a additive that we put into coolant in order to work as a corrosion inhibitor. Mm -hmm. The chemistry is, a, is the fact that when you put water through a nuclear reaction, the water will break apart. A, a certain amount of it will go to H2 and O2 within the, the coolant. That's an equilibrium reaction, and the way that you try to make sure that the oxygen doesn't cause a problem is you put extra hydrogen in to drive the equation to the point where there's less oxygen there. Mm -hmm. So we add hydrogen to coolant all the time. So whenever you vent primary coolant, you must do something to get rid of the hydrogen so it doesn't build up and explode. There's systems in place in, in nuclear reactors to do that. There's hydrogen scavenging systems. The problem is that hydrogen scavenging systems require electricity. Uh, they're battery powered and they, they work a lot well for a, a long time, but apparently the, those systems were, not, were no longer functioning in the particular places where the hydrogen built up. Now, the reason that the um, operators are venting coolant is the way that you keep a reactor cool if you've got uh, no electricity. And John, I'm, I'll be right back. I'm fixing something. The 
video is kind of a little issue. Mm -hmm. Should I stop mine? Nope. Okay. We'll let them fix it. We'll get the uh, blogging heads people just to. Yeah, I forgot to turn off my uh, uh, sleep timer. So anyway, I'm sorry. So it's okay. Get where I was. I was talking, telling you that the uh, there is no power there. There's no electricity being supplied by the grid. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some emergency generation available, and some some power to to supply the coolant pumps, but. It's okay in, a, in reactors because we have a way to get rid of heat, and you simply fill the reactor and let some water boil off. The boiling removes a lot of heat because there's something called the latent heat of vaporization, and it removes a lot of heat out of the reactor and keeps it from getting to any melting point. But in order to do that, you have to vent the coolant. You have to put it somewhere. The, the reactors have a system that allows that, water to be vented off and to go through a, a, a suppression chamber that scrubs out essentially all of the um, fission products except for a few volatile fission products. There are a few gaseous fission products like krypton, uh, xenon, iodine uh, that will still be able to be vented off. The, react the operators are trying to keep that stuff suppressed as long as they can so that it doesn't get into the public, mm -hmm. rightfully so. Uh, that's where the, the source of hydrogen is. But the, um, they, didn't do a, they did not do as well as they would have liked, but the majority, the vast majority of the fission products remain in the core, remain in the pressure vessel, remain in the containment. There are a few detectable ones. Now remember, you and I are old enough to remember the days when uh, there was testing going on uh, of nuclear uh, bombs and stuff in the atmosphere. And we used to be able to detect an explosion from Russia in the U.S. within hours mm -hmm. because of the, the fact that radiation and radioactive materials can be detected at such tiny levels that the, the fact that somebody says, well, I've detected radiation doesn't really mean much. You have to find out how much radiation have they detected. And, you know, I read about the, the contamination of the guys on the ships. Yes, they found detectable levels, but the levels were incredibly tiny. And they were caused because the helicopter flew very close to the plant. Why, why have the Japanese then withdrawn almost all their workers? Um, as my understanding is that there's only a skeleton crew now mm -hmm. um, working in the plants, and, um, and most of the people have been withdrawn for uh, for safety reasons. Even though I would think that um, they need lots of personnel to try to handle the situation. Well, with what they're doing, they really don't need very many people, okay? Mm -hmm. All they're doing is trying to supply water and vent off the coolant. So really, there's no need to have a whole lot of people there. There's not a lot of fixing going on. There's not anything broken. There's no pipes broken. They're venting coolant, and, and yeah, they, they now, you know, blew the siding off of a, of a steel frame building. Um, but there's not a reason for a lot of people. So... Traditionally, the way that the nuclear industry works is we have something we call a LARA, which is as low as reasonably achievable. You don't expose people to radiation for, for no good reason. And the industry, quite honestly, is full of people that are just as afraid of radiation as the rest of the population. Some people within the industry recognize a lot more about what the the science has told us about the health effects of radiation over the years, but it's still accepted within the industry and by regulation that all radiation, all the way down to the minimal, is, is potentially dangerous. I personally believe it's sort of like saying that all aspirin is potentially dangerous. 
even if, you know, one, a bottle of aspirin will kill somebody if they take it. But if, you know, a thousand people take one aspirin each, it's not going to kill any of them. And if you take that, you know, thousand aspirin and you break them up into about, oh, a, a thousand pieces each and you give them to a million people, nobody's going to have any effect. And that's kind of, you know, what happens. The levels get so low that they're indistinguishable from the background radiation that we get on our planet. Uh, you know, we live in a planet that is not a zero radiation place. It's the radiation on average is somewhere around, you know, 300 to 600 millirem per year. However, there are places in the world where the average person gets as much as 8,000 millirem per year, and there's no detectable health uh, decrease in those places. Places like Ramsar, Iran is one. Rod, worst, what is your worst case scenario right now? It, it's, are you saying that even if, um, let's say, you do have a significant meltdown in these reactors, you still have, have them uh, contained, they're in the containment uh, buildings, and so you would not expect anything like Chernobyl, for example. So already there are being comparisons made to Three Mile Island and, uh, and Chernobyl. Let, let's, let's talk about some of the worst things that could happen uh, and put them in the context of some of these other um, previous very well-known sure. accidents. I think the worst case right now is having three, three Mile Islands at the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much the worst case. Um, what that means is you have three times zero health effects. You have three times broken reactors, though. So it's possible that none of those three reactors will ever again operate. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have the possibility of three times worth of, of a lot of gnashing of teeth and a lot of ordered evacuations and confused officials and confused communications, but the, the end result is I'm, I am confident that the end result is that nobody in the general public will be exposed to any unhealthy levels of radiation, and I'm confident that the only injuries to the workers are going to be relatively standard industrial type injuries of knocking their heads around during, you know, getting bumped and bruised and battered during a, uh, an overpressurization called an explosion. Uh, there was one guy who I believe, uh, I think there was a report of a guy who got killed during the earthquake when he was operating a crane that happened to be at a nuclear power plant. That's not a nuclear accident. You know, lots of people got killed during an earthquake. Um, uh, and and I, I'm not trying to minimize that. I, I think that it's important for people to understand that the operators are doing a hard job in a hard place. Um, but what they're trying to do is to protect the investment in the plant as much as they can uh, and hope that at some point they'll be able to fix the plants. But I don't see any way that a lot of radiation is going to leave that facility and get to the general public. There's, there's too many layers. There's too much physics and chemistry involved. To, to allow that to happen. There's no mechanism to lift that core, grind it up finely, and distribute it to the population. What about the, um, what about the spent fuel rods, um, which apparently in one of the, uh, the holding tanks have already caught fire? Well, I'm a little confused about what's happening at uh, Unit 4. Unit 4 was shut down for an inspection before the earthquake ever happened, so it was never operating. Mm -hmm. There is a report that there was a fire at Unit 4, but the fire is has been put out already, based on uh, reports that I've read. There was, there's was there been a lot of talk about it associated with the cooling pool. I'm not sure how 23 feet of water disappears in three days, uh, because that's how much water is above the, the fuel that's stored there. I haven't read any reports of, of detected leakage from the, from the system. So I believe, and, and I, I, I'm, I don't have details on this one, but I, from what I know, I would say that there's been some people speculating 
that it's a cool uh, a, a spent fuel pool fire, and I don't think that's reality. I think we're going to find out that there was a fire that may have involved some rags or gloves or something. I don't know. Uh, it, there was a fire. It got put out, and there was a, a fairly significant uh, level of radiation measured at the plant fairly briefly. And radiation dose to people, I mean, there's an important distinction between three things. <clears throat> there's something called radiation doses, radiation dose rate, and contamination. Mm -hmm. The dose is how much radiation does a person actually absorb. The dose rate is how fast is the radiation coming at you. So if you are in a place that has a dose rate of, say, 10 rem per hour, that's not a place you really want to be. But if you're only there for a minute, you get 1 60th of 10 rem. Mm -hmm. Okay? So your dose is a few, uh, a few tens of millirem mm -hmm. in that case. So that, that's why reactor, I mean, uh, nuclear... Uh, personnel are trained to pay attention to time, distance, and shielding. So if you're in a place where there's a lot of radiation, you step back. The radiation dose drops with the square of the distance. It's called the inverse square law. So if the radiation dose is 100 at a meter, the radiation dose is only um, 25 at two meters, mm -hmm. okay, and if you double the distance again, you drop it by another factor of four. Okay, so at, in that case, at four meters, the radiation dose would be four, or you know, six. So, big difference between 100 and six. So, you, you minimize your, your, your distance, and you maximize your distance, you minimize your time, and if you can, you step behind big thick walls or, or steel uh, plates or something to provide some shielding. Contamination. Well, let me ask you to, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I, I was going to say, um, apart from um, the actual uh, safety issues and, and worst case scenarios and so forth, uh, I know that you have really emphasized the economics of nuclear power. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think you've said yourself that it, it looked, it seems probable that um, it, that three of these reactors might be shut down for a long time or permanently. Mm -hmm. And um, you are going to have other uh, reactor builders or potential reactor builders around the world looking at that. Uh, what is this accident going to do to the um, the whole issue of the economics of nuclear power? Good question. Um, it's important to remember that the reactors that we're talking about are all several decades old. Uh, I believe it's like 40 years, 35 and 36, something like that. So they've been operating a long time. And quite honestly, they don't have anywhere near the safety features and the, the levels of, of protection that some very modern reactors have. Uh, that doesn't mean they're unsafe. It's sort of on the order of, hey, if I had a 1960 Corvette, or I mean 1970 Corvette, I wouldn't counsel anybody to stop driving it, even though it doesn't have seatbelts, doesn't have a headrest, and doesn't have airbags, mm -hmm. and probably doesn't have as good a suspension system and as good a tires as we build today. It doesn't mean it's unsafe. It just means you've got to operate a little more carefully so you don't run into somebody. Mm -hmm. um, so these reactors, the fact that they are going to be economic losses is probably should not be attributed to the fact that they're nuclear power plants. It's attributed to the fact that they are industrial facilities located on the coast in a place where they had a tsunami. If they were uh, microprocessor chip fabs, it cost two or four billion dollars a piece, they would be lost, a complete economic loss as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the people that own the facilities do have property insurance uh, to prevent 
or to, to repay losses, they're going to have economic challenges. I believe that the, the, the post-accident analysis, if done properly, will, will recognize that the damage done to the nuclear plants is probably less than the damage that was, has been done to all kinds of other industrial and energy facilities. One of the things that kind of bugs me about the coverage has been I've watched uh, a few newscasts where the commentators talking about nuclear plants having a problem, and because they couldn't find enough dramatic footage, they were running in the background footage of LNG tanks burning with right. dramatic fires and black smoke. And that kind of bothers me. You know, if you're talking about nuclear, don't show me pictures of LNG and not make it clear that that's not a nuclear facility. Rod, um, as you know, Joe Lieberman, who actually is, a, uh, I think, a supporter of um, uh, nuclear energy in this country and of uh, Barack Obama's plan to support um, construction of new reactors, has called for a moratorium until the lessons of Japan uh, can be sifted through. Um, I just wonder what, if you think that that is a, uh, a reasonable proposal. I, I think it's a moratorium on construction of new reactors. I think it's a terrible proposal because, first of all, the nuclear industry has been analyzing and learning from things like total station blackouts for a long time. We have already put in place a significant number of additional requirements and additional engineering to overcome the potential of a total station blackout that lasts for days. And so I think it'd be a real mistake to say, okay, all of you guys have invested billions of dollars already in building the new reactors at Vogel or at at VC Summer in South Carolina, you guys just stop, hold, and we'll do some more analysis on this stuff, in which time the world continues to burn natural gas at an at a, uh, increasing rate. Um, we continue to burn coal. We continue to burn oil. The, the people that are invested in those plants already are employed and, and ready to, to run and, and are doing the good work Again, with plant designs that take into account lessons learned over the decades since F Fukushima Daiichi was constructed. Mm -hmm. So a moratorium, a halt right now, is wrong because the plants that we're talking about have nothing to do with the plants in Japan. I mean, I don't think there's going to be a tidal wave hitting the Vogel plant in eastern Georgia. Mm -hmm. It's a long way from the coast. The same thing you, at the VC Summer plant in South Carolina. Do you think that there will be um, or should be uh, a, another look at, um, at siting of plants, uh, at, um, at the possibility of earthquakes in, uh, in some regions? Or, or has that already been taken care of? Well, we have some significantly stringent seismic requirements uh, in the U.S. when we're doing, and, and, and around the world, when you're doing design work. And we already have significant efforts to evaluate sites with regard to the seismic stability. Um, we, in the U.S., are not going to build a new nuclear power plant on the coast because First of all, coastal property is kind of expensive. That's one reason. But, uh, you know, most of the new plants that are going to be built, at least for the next few years, probably the next decade or so, are going to be built on sites that already have nuclear power plants in operation and where the seismic uh, requirements have already been pretty well established and understood. So, no, I, I don't think we're going to change anything. I think it's worthwhile to do some analysis and to think about, well, you know, we, we thought that the, the maximum tsunami was going to be 6.5 meters. It was 7.5. We'll build the wall for 10 next time. I, you know, we tend, generally tend to do some overkill, and I think we'll probably do that. But uh, 
I don't expect there to need to be any real significant slowdown. Again, energy is not produced in a vacuum. You know, you don't have a choice between nuclear and perfect. You have a choice between nuclear, natural gas, coal, oil, and then some unreliable weather-dependent alternatives that can't supply power if the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. One of the big issues for um, for nuclear power in this country has been, uh, well, really the economic issues, and Wall Street has been reluctant to get behind uh, construction of, of uh, new plants, or it's been somewhat timid, which is one reason why Barack Obama wanted to put up federal money to help insure the plants. So how will, how will what's happened in Japan change uh, that situation, in the uh, um, insurance of, of new plants and the, uh, uh, the issue of uh, what in investors can expect to get on their return and the, the, uh, the risk of these investments? All good questions. Um, first of all, I want to make it clear again to, to everybody who's listening that the proposal for a loan guarantee is not an expenditure by the federal government any more than me co-signing my daughter's first car loan cost me any money. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know my daughter. I understand what she does. I am trusting of her that she'll pay the loan. And as a matter of fact, she just did pay it off. I just got the title in the mail from her, her first car. Mm -hmm. My daughter's 26 years old. When she was 20 years old, a, a bank wouldn't loan her money except at a much higher interest rate than they would loan it if I co-signed it. Okay, so that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about the government co-signing a loan for a power plant that is going to be able to produce reliable electricity at a very low marginal cost. Once the power plant gets built, there is no way that it won't operate and produce power. Mm -hmm. The risk that Wall Street has is they don't trust that they are going to be allowed to actually get the plant to the point where it produces revenue. And it's not because of Three Mile Island. The thing that Wall Street is most af afraid of is something called the Shoreham Syndrome. And you being from New York probably understand what I mean by that. Yes, the Shoreham I remember Syndrome Shoreham is, well. The Shoreham Syndrome is when people for whatever reason, it goes through a lot of problems and they finally get a plant built. They get it licensed. They do low power testing and then somebody says, uh, I don't want that plant to operate. Six billion dollars worth of investment and somebody said, I'm not going to let the plant operate um, so we're going to destroy it. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that scares the, uh, everything out of a Wall Street investor. Uh, it scares Wall Street to know that there was a time when investors put a lot of money into a fuel recycling facility at Barnwell, and after an election, the president signed an executive order that made fuel recycling illegal. So, I mean, that's it's the political risk that somebody's going to change the rules when you're almost ready to start making money after you've made a huge investment. I mean, building a new nuclear power plant in the U.S. today, the first ones are going to cost, oh, seven billion dollars per unit, which is a lot of money. But it's going to be able to produce somewhere around eight billion kilowatt hours of electricity every single year. When you start running the numbers, you realize that the guy who makes that investment, can pay back his loan as long as he's allowed to produce electricity. Rod, just, okay, I, I know what you want to happen, but <laughs> try, to, try to give me your best guess of what will happen. I mean, you've already on your blog have talked about how, in your view, um, irresponsible anti-nuclear activists have been all over what's happening in Japan to make the case that nuclear power is just too risky and uh, we should not build more reactors in this uh, country. Uh, you already have people like Joe Lieberman who actually are pro-nuclear who are saying at the very least 
we need a moratorium. I think a lot of people who are on the fence, even some environmentalists who are leaning toward uh, nuclear, maybe having second thoughts now. Um, you know, you've got the not in my backyard syndrome already with nukes, and I, and, and I would think that, uh, you know, this is just going to exacerbate those problems. Politically, socially, what do you really think will happen as a result of um, what's going on in Japan right now? You know, there's an old saying that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. <laughs> um, all I can say is I do not intend to stand by and allow others to set the agenda. Nuclear energy is very important to the long-term future of human society. And there will be, there's no doubt in my mind that there were people, and I know this for a fact, there were organizations with talking points already prepared just in case something bad happened. So that, and they had Rolodexes ready to go to get their folks in front of the cameras as soon as something bad happened. They figure somewhere, somebody's going to do something, and it, we're going to be able to use this stuff. I mean, I found the talking points online. Physicians for Social Responsibility is, is one of them, for example. Okay? I know that there's opposition. I know there's reason, reasons why there's opposition. We agreed I wasn't going to you know, share my theories as to why there's so many... Uh, people that are opposed to the growth and market penetration of nuclear energy. Um, well, and well, I know, you know that if you the... really want to do that, I'm not <laughs> gonna, I'm not gonna stop you. Um, <laughs> you. You know, you tell people whatever you like. No, I, it should be pretty evident to anybody who's ever been in a competitive business that the competitors will do all they can to hurt the entry of a new competitor. Uh, they teach this in Business One on One. They call it raise the barriers of entry to competition. There's no doubt in my mind that the people who sell coal, oil, and natural gas understand those business rules very clearly. They were taught them. They've seen them. Uh, they know that if we build a significant number of new nuclear plants in the U.S., each one of those plants that comes online will take about 365 to $400 million worth of revenue out of the pockets of the natural gas industry. It's just a fact. I mean, th there's a certain amount of need for electricity. The fact that we build nuclear plants doesn't mean that people can use more electricity. It just means that they'll use more nuclear electricity and less electricity coming from burning something. Just a, that's a, I think that's an economic fact. And it should be pretty evident to people that, that there are folks who have a significant interest in slowing down the nuclear renaissance. And if they can, they'd like to put it off for another couple of decades. Until but, you, they uh, but, really I mean, but you must acknowledge that there are, there are people who don't like nuclear energy for strictly um, technical reasons because they, they think it's too uh, risky. They think that there's something about uh, radioactive substances that poses a, uh, a unique risk. Um, Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, um, Natural Resources Defense Council, organizations like that are, you know, don't have economic motives to oppose nuclear power. Oh, really? No economic motives? <laughs> I mean, where would some of those organizations be if they didn't have a, an issue like fighting nuclear energy? I mean... There's, there are folks that have done that as their career. I mean, Paul Gunter, his career has been, I'm an anti-nuclear activist, community organizer against nuclear energy, whatever you want to call it. I mean, that's what he gets paid to do. Uh, there are other people who, who do that, and if you took that issue away, I don't know what they would do with themselves. So, you know, there's all kinds of ways to have economic interest. People accuse me of having economic interest even though I, you know, I, I've been a, an advocate of nuclear energy when my employer, the U.S. Navy, wasn't really all that happy with me doing it. I mean, they didn't encourage me at all, I'll, I'll tell you, to, to be a blogger, to get out there and tell people why I get so excited by, let me see if I got it in my pocket. 
Eh, I mean, I mean, I don't have it right now, but I usually carry a little uh, pellet with me. I, I mean, I get so excited about the fact that a tiny little pellet has as much energy as two, I mean, as, as one ton of coal. I've got it here pellet. with me, Rod. I'm going to hold it up on my end, okay? Okay, I mean, that, that should excite I people. The, the waste products from that one pellet is the same size as the pellet. So that's a ton of coal. to the pellet. There you go. I think I've got one here somewhere. Oh, here's one. I usually have yeah, enough. It's, it's, that pellet this is, my is card. the equivalent of one ton of coal, 149 gallons of oil, and uh, 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. And yep. it's, you know, it's like the tip of my pinky. Yeah. And, and if you do it economically, right now with all the overhead that we put onto commercial nuclear fuel, the, the fabrication, the, the enrichment, the making a provision for the waste, everything, nuclear fuel costs about 57 cents per million BTU. And even cheap natural gas costs $3.50 per million BTU. And in 2008, just a couple of years ago, natural gas was selling for $10, $12 per million BTU. And nuclear was still 57 cents. My, I personally believe the reason that, or one of the reasons why Wall Street's not terribly interested in financing new nuclear today is because natural gas, instead of being at $12, fell all the way down to $3.50. And in a natural gas plant, 70, 80%, 90% of the cost is fuel. You know, so it's cheap to build them. And as long as you can have somebody provide you fuel, you know, it's, it's, you can make money. But with a nuclear plant, it's a risk because you put all your money in up front. And you don't know what the price of your production is going to be. But you do know that you'll be able to produce and sell everything you can make. It's just a matter of how much will the sale go for. So it really matters to an investor whether they think the price of electricity when the unit comes online is 10 cents a kilowatt hour or whether they think it's going to be 8 cents a kilowatt hour or 5 cents a kilowatt hour because every one of those is a huge difference in revenue. So the, I guess, the numbers are numbers are hard to run. Well, well I, I, I guess that there has been at least a, a temporary um, decline in, in the prices of uh, certainly of oil because basically the Japanese economy is shut down or partially mm -hmm. shut down. And uh, so this great consumer of fossil fuels um, uh, has, uh, has sort of gone offline. And, uh, and, and as a result, at least this is a couple of days ago, I heard this on uh, CNN that um, you had um, a, a really sharp drop in, in oil prices. Yep. Oil and natural gas, the balance between supply and demand is, is very tentative or very fragile, I should say. You know, it, it, we worldwide, we use about 80 million barrels of oil a day. And if you read and follow OPEC decision making, you'll find that they make discussions. They, they have, uh, you know, how are they going to keep the price at the level they want it to be? And they talk about adjusting production by a few hundred thousand, maybe a million barrels of oil a day. So they're only playing with, you know, roughly 1% of the world's supply can adjust the price. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you have somebody, you, you consume 80 million barrels a day, you only have a certain amount of storage. If you had a, an extra, say, two or three million barrels a day being produced compared to what was being used, it's only a week later you start to run out of storage space. Mm -hmm. You know? An extra 2 million barrels a day means after a week you got 14 million barrels sitting around somewhere. After two weeks you got 28 million barrels sitting around somewhere. It starts to get pretty hard to figure out where to put all this stuff. <laughs> so the prices are, are real volatile. Conversely, if... Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I just said if not... I, no, sorry, you speak. <laughs> <laughs> if there's not enough supply, the prices go up pretty high. Or if people think there's not enough supply down the road, the prices will jump, which, of course, puts a lot of money into the pockets of the people that are selling it. You know, for Saudi Arabia, the difference between uh, selling oil at $100 a barrel and selling oil at $20 a barrel is 
relatively enormous. Yeah, I would think. Um, before we run out of time, I wanted to be sure to ask you about, about um, a really interesting option that we talked about last time on Blogging Heads, which is uh, really small nuclear reactors. Uh, so instead of having these gigantic uh, centralized reactors, of the kind uh, that you have in Japan now with with these uh, troubles, you have lots of small distributed uh, reactors, um, the size that are on uh, U.S. nuclear submarines, of the kind that you served on, for example. And I know that this is something that you've um, thought about a lot. So I wonder if you can talk about the pros and cons of of that nuclear option, mini nukes. <laughs> Okay, well, you've given me the opportunity, I guess the responsibility, to make a disclosure here. Um, since we last talked, I have retired from the Navy. Uh, mm -hmm. And in September, September 1st, I left the Navy. September 15th, I took a job with Babcock and Wilcox uh, on the Empower Reactor Project. Mm -hmm. uh, so my professional day job is uh, working on a team that is designing uh, and, and soon to be building uh, small modular reactors in the United States with United States supplied parts, mm -hmm. uh, North American supplied parts, I should say, because we have a pretty big group up in Canada that does stuff for us. But uh, so I, I, I got to disclose that I am professionally interested in in working on uh, designing small distributed nuclear power plants. When you say small, how small do you mean? B&W Empower Reactor is 125 megawatts, so it's about, uh, say, one-fifth the size of the Diachi plants, because they're, they're relatively small plants. They're maybe seven or 800 megawatts, so ours is 125 megawatts mm -hmm. per unit. And, and, and how, big, how, how big physically is that structure? Um... It's, it's not tiny. It's uh, about 65 feet tall for the pressure vessel. The whole structure will be maybe uh, 110 feet tall and uh, maybe 110 feet in diameter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a substantial plant. It's not a huge plant. The desire is to build plants that are um, able to be done mostly in a factory on a predictable schedule and where we can tell the customer... Uh, you want this plant, this is how much it's going to cost, and the customer will be able to say, those guys deliver on time and on budget. Mm -hmm. so a kind of assembly at, line approach to making nuclear reactors. Absolutely. That, we want to, to learn some lessons that were learned in the 1900s, early 1900s, you know, on series production and doing the same thing over and over again and driving down the cost of production by learning by increasing our unit volume and, and making improvements in our processes so that each plant costs a little bit less than the plant before it. Who would the customers for these be at this point? The first one that has uh, announced their interest is the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, mm -hmm. Several uh, months ago, the Tennessee Valley Authority indicated that they plan to build a group of our reactors, they call it a six-pack, uh, at the Clinch River site uh, outside the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And what what's the advantage of this? Um, we're not, now, you're not talking about the the really small reactors. I mean, we I think uh, when we spoke last time, you were talking about reactors that could be the size of uh, a box car, for example. Uh, I mean, the whole thing, it could just it right. could be possibly even um, put underground and you could have one of these supplying um, electricity for a mid-sized town, for example. Yep. And, and there's a company called Hyperion that's doing, it's aiming in that direction. Uh, they, they have a reactor that's about 25 megawatts. As John uh, Deal, who's the CEO of that company, describes it, uh, the whole reactor part, the heat source, is roughly the size of taking two hot tubs, you know, residential hot tubs, and putting them on top of each other. Uh, mm. So that there are people that are doing that. There's another company that's sort of in between. Uh, Hyperion's at 25 megawatts. New Scale's at 45 megawatts. 
We're at 125. Westinghouse has got one that's about 200 megawatts. So there's a, a competition heating up. I, I've been invited to about four different conferences between now and the end of May um, on small modular reactors here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to go to them all. I'm just letting you know there people are getting excited. It's it's a it's a field of endeavor where there's a lot of interest. The advantage to the various sizes is different customers have different size needs and it allows a customer the opportunity to build a plant at a much lower entry cost and to add units as they need them. You know, even a company as big as TVA, their annual growth in electricity demand is only on the order of a couple hundred megawatts. So if they were to build large plants, every time they bring on a large plant, they bring on five years worth of growth. So they, you know, that kind of a lumpy way to bring power into your, your grid. And that's a big company. So mm -hmm. anyway. What, um, what would be the licensing and regulation situation for these smaller reactors? Would it be exactly the same as it is for the really big ones? Or uh, are there extra safety issues? Are there fewer safety issues? Uh, for the reactors that we're looking, the company I work for is building reactors that are evolutions of existing light water reactor designs. Mm -hmm. So both my B&W and New Scale are building or aiming to build reactors that will be licensed in the same manner. There's a few rules that have to change, but not affecting the safety. The safety rules are the same for us. The rules that are, we have to work on is something affecting the, the fee structure. Right now, because essentially in the U.S., react as, as uh, Al Gore said, reactors come in one size, extra large. And because that's the way the U.S.'s fleet is, all the reactors are roughly the same size. Um, to make things easier, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission fees to the industry for the privilege of being regulated is the same for every reactor. Mm -hmm. Even no matter, you know, every reactor pays the same. So for us, if we had a 125 megawatt reactor paying exactly the same fee as a guy paying who's got a 1200 megawatt reactor, well, per unit energy, he's got a lot easier time paying that fee than we do. Per unit revenue, he's got a lot more easier time paying that fee. And we also believe that our reactors are far simpler for the regulators to look at because they're much smaller. And they don't take so much time to look at. So the inspections are a lot lower. The, the, uh, the, the challenges of regulating them become less because they're simpler. So anyway, about, the, the fee structures. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask about the security issues. Um, do you, would uh, Even if we're talking about these really small reactors, uh, the one, you know, two hot tubs put together. Um, would that still need to be protected from people who might want to try to blow it up and cause a, a uh, radiation release? Or could these be designed so that they are really uh, immune to that sort of attack? There's a philosophy that we're, the small modular reactor oper or designers are trying to help people understand is, in some cases, you can replace guards with concrete and, and the ground by burying things, by surrounding them with enough layers of concrete and having some passive protection. Um, there's also a recognition, at least in our case and some others, that we're going to have many of the same rules uh, as others. So the philosophy of ours is that we expect that we will have some of the same protection rules, but we'll put more units on a site. And so eventually the cost of the guards is roughly the same per unit electricity as the cost of the guards for anybody else, because instead of having one unit on a site, we may have six units on a site, mm -hmm. eight units on a site, something like that. Um, well, we're almost out of time. I, I guess uh, give us a, uh, Give us your thoughts about the um, the media coverage of what's going on in Japan and 
and uh, what you think of it so far and and how this could possibly even benefit the revival of nuclear energy in uh, this country. Do you see any way, I mean, apart from your own efforts, do you think that the mainstream, do you, do you think it's plausible that uh, the mainstream media will somehow find an upside in, um, in what's happened? And have you seen any sign of that so far? I haven't seen any signs so far. I've seen a few real minor signs, but it's it's hard. I, I I'm I'm not happy at all with the coverage. I really can't blame the media because the industry hasn't done a, a real bang up job at helping them understand what's going on, and quite legitimately, I guess there are people who are looking for the next update on what's happening at the nuclear plants. And because they're looking for the next update, it's sort of like when a, a big storm's coming or something like that, the news media is going to keep telling you what the next update is because as long as people are tuning in for the next update, that's their job, right? They, they need to respond to what their customers want. And getting eyeballs is kind of their job. Um, so if people want to see the next update on the nuclear issue and forget about the fact that there's 10,000 people dead and there's villages that no longer exist and there's people that don't have any fresh water or, or food, and, and those are the health effects that are really going to start to have some real serious consequences very soon if we don't fix them, um, then I guess the media is doing what they're supposed to be doing. I, I would prefer if they would recognize that although the people at the plant have a lot of work to do and there's exciting things to say about what they're doing every few minutes, um, the public is not really going to be affected. There's nothing that the public should be doing. I, I think it's horrible that the government ordered an evacuation because that's probably on the checklist somewhere without thinking about the fact that there's so many newly homeless people already looking for shelter, and if somebody near the nuclear plant has a good home, they should stay there. I mean, that, they should be out on the streets with everybody else who needs to find a place to, to bed down for the night. You think so, any of those evacuations were unnecessary around the place? I think it, absolutely. In my opinion, as a technologist and as somebody who's really studied the health effects of radiation, I can almost never imagine ordering an evacuation in an area near a licensed, contained reactor plant. Mm -hmm. Just There's so many reasons why an evacuation is dangerous, uh, you know, Putting people out on the streets when there's no real danger to them, it's not the smart thing to do. Um, I, I really just don't believe that's a good response. Yeah. I'm, I'm, kind, I'm, a, I'm a minority. I don't speak for anybody. And, and please also remember, I'm not speaking for any company here. I'm Rod Adams, a blogger who happens to have a job. <laughs> um, because blogging is not a very good paying job. Yeah, I know that well. Um, <laughs> well, Rod, I... Um, I really appreciate what you've done here to try to uh, to put this in uh, in uh, perspective, and um, I can't say that you have uh, totally eased my concerns. I'm one of those people who keeps checking the um, the news reports, keeps keeps uh, tuning in on CNN, looking at the uh, at the stories in the New York Times, and I guess what what a lot of money is. You know, there seems to be news coming out, and uh, and things seem to be evolving in a, a direction that is somewhat scary. But um, I, you know, I I guess I'll I'll take your word for it that that there are still really um, significant containments that will prevent any genuine health effects from happening from from what's going on there. But you know, we'll have to see. Okay, I, I, I just hope that, that, you know, I'll send you a copy of that paper that I'm talking about from science, but mm -hmm. I really do think it's important for people to take a deep breath, think about what's really important to them, what's really important in, in terms of health effects and living, and let the people at the plant do their job. They're going to make mistakes, they're going to have to be creative, they're going to do some things, but they will 
handle the situation to plant. Not having any electricity is a really hard thing, no matter what your job is. And so that's part of the reason why I'm so excited and so adamant that we really need nuclear, because I hate the idea of having an industrial society that doesn't have enough power to do what people want to do. Right. So. Thanks All a right. lot, hey, Rod. And, take care, John. Um, I hope this is. A... I hope there's not so much news that I have to drag you back on to uh, Wagging <laughs> Heads TV sometime soon. All right. <laughs> well, you take care. I, right, I hope the news calms down. But all right. Bye, okay. John. Bye, bye.